Welcome back to a series that I haven't done since December of 2017. Why haven't I done this particular series? Well, because I'm busy doing other stuff. With this particular this particular video, it's the return of Nick Lange's movie reviews. Yep, it's back after 16 months. Yep. Okay, but what's the first? Now, generally, when I've done this particular review series, I've generally reviewed like movies. Yes, the last one I did is basically a review of pretty much like all the films saw 2017. I did get a chance to do that. I kind of basically did that with my things I look, 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 looking back at 2018. Mm -hmm. But now, an official movie review. Now, originally this was basically done as a series of review. Now, this is basically episode 58, I should point out. It's basically just a DVD review series. I was basically got the idea from the series from Mike Ventura from from comic. Well, originally it was Dark Avenger Inc. Now it's Comic Frontline. Mm -hmm. I of course never met the man. I have spoke to him maybe a couple times via comments, but I've never actually met him before. I've met Cap at Comic Frontline, but I've never met anybody else at Comic Frontline. His DVD review series kind of gave me the idea to do this series originally. I changed the name of DVD reviews to Movie Views Episode 21 because I basically was reviewing not only DVDs, but I've also reviewed VHS tapes, and I've also reviewed Blu-rays. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, this is like a series about movies. Let's talk about a movie. How about a movie that was released in 1979? Yep. On, believe it or not, December 7th, 1959, Pearl Harbor Day. This year marks the 40th anniversary this film was released. What film is this? Star Trek The Motion Picture. Yep. Now, I recently got this particular thing. This is basically the first 10 films in this collection. Basically, it cost me like $25, but it's well worth it. Now, I actually have Star Trek The Motion Picture on VHS. So I'm going to talk about the DVD version of it. And I should point out that of the original 10 films, this is the longest. Not counting director's cut for the second film. Yes. This film is roughly 2 hours and 11 minutes. It Here it is right here. Here's DVD, what it looks like. There it is. Yep. Now, let's talk about a bit of the backstory for this particular film. It's been very well documented, basically, of how this movie was got made. Well, initially put, Gene Rottenberry, the creator of Star Trek, wanted to do a movie while it, it was basically back in the late 60s, when the show was on there, he basically the whole show was basically his idea. But whenever it comes to him writing an action episode, half the time the episodes don't turn out very good. They're usually considered one of the worst episodes of Star Trek. Whatever he comes up with his bizarre ideas. I mean, there's some interesting ideas that have basically on his watch. We got the Krays, the Klingons, the Romulans, the original cast. I'm trying to think who else. Uh, the main villain of Star Trek Two, which I'll we'll get to that in the future episode. And a lot of basically this stuff happened while he was in charge. The final season of the show, he basically was removed from his head, head to create and basically got booted upstairs. And people basically who ran the show pretty much was just like, okay, let's just basically try to run the show without Gene Rottenberry basically breathing on our necks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably the whole gist of it anyways. Now, initially also, Leonard Nimoy wanted to direct an episode of the original series. Yes, this has also been documented. He was turned down. Never thinking, an actor of a TV show direct, asking to direct an episode? That's commonplace today. It's been commonplace since the late 80s. Now, as of apparently the reasoning for this, I've never heard exactly the reason why, basically, the people who were in charge of the Star Trek TV show from the 60s, the original show, why they turned him down for. Yeah, and of course, the guy himself became a critical acclaimed director, directing two of the best films of the, of the original ten films, and of course, appearing on two episodes of Star Trek Next Generation, and of course being a producer of the films. Sadly, before his passing in 2000, I have seen his last film appearance on screen, which was in Star Trek Into Darkness. Mm -hmm. I saw that in theaters. Not a bad movie, per se, though it did rip off one of the best films in the entire series. Now, the whole thing about this particular film, now, initially, they said no, but then, thanks to Star Wars, this film was made. Now, just by sheer coincidence, they were thinking, 1979, sci-fi. What famous sci-fi film was released in 1979, aside from Star Trek Picture? Why, it was Alien, 
Ridley Scott's Alien was released the same exact year. And by the way, that's also his 40th anniversary this year. That's kind of a weird thing about this year. Not many franchise celebrate anniversary this year. I mean, the first one I can think of was probably Alien. Aside from that, there's like virtually nothing when it comes to franchises because that's not really major celebrating this year. Heck, hardly any characters made a debut back in like, let's say, a, a particular nine. I mean, there's some films that basically are, that celebrate anniversary this year. This is one of them. I would say one of them that has a big anniversary this year is 1969's I Mentioned Secret Service. I'm going to review a James Bond film in the near future, but now, but this episode, I'm just talking about this particular film. Now, the director of the film, believe it or not, is a guy by the name of Robert Weiss. This is by far the only film he's ever directed for, for the particular series because he never directed any other film after this. Though the style of the film, if you watch the film because it's the late 70s, this film basically is noteworthy for its pacing problems and how very similar to that is that for Stanley Kubert's 2001 Space Science. It's very similar tone to it. Now, pretty much this film is set roughly about two years af after the five-year mission wrapped up, roughly taking place in the year 20 2272. And Kirk, who has been promoted to Admiral, in because this was actually explained in an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, those of you curious, though, like, what year did Kirk's five-year ISCN? 2270. That's basically what ended. And, of course, there was a comic that released this week called Year 5, which had basically him getting announced when he was promoted to Admiral. Yeah, the year five basically set during the five year mission, which was never shown on screen, the the, the final year. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course, thanks to this motion as Admiral, the Enterprise went through a two year refit. Oh, fun fact. If you watch the first six films, not counting if you count if you count all six films that have featured Enterprise, you probably notice that the bridge always looks different. There's a reason for that. Because Paramount had the strange assumption for years that this is going to be the only film they make. So that after the film was completed, they destroyed the set. They had to keep rebuilding the set every time. And my guess is the reason why, like, if you watch, let's say, Next Generation films, like, the three films for Enterprise E, the bridge looks exactly the same. There's no change to it at all. In the case of the D bridge, all they did was basically tone on the lights. They didn't change, change the, hardly the bridge, how it looked. I mean, aside from the change in lighting, it's virtually the same bridge. Now, there's been no explanation of why that the ship looks like that in, in, in story, but it's also kind of the same thing with the J. James films. That's one thing you got praised by the films. The bridge never changed, despite the fact it looks like an Apple creation bridge, and it's very bright because J. J. Abrams, kind of like Spielberg, has thing for flashy lights in his films. In the case of this film, it's kind of like that, but this thing. Here's the thing about this particular film. This film, at the time, up until Star Trek, I would say Star Trek Generations, had the highest budget of all the films, because the budget got decreased with like with the following film. See, this film was budgeted at $46 million, which normally films nowadays would not be made for that much. If this was a sci-fi film made nowadays, it probably made for about $200 million. Yes, probably about a hundred, maybe two hundred million dollars, not forty-six million. You probably expect that for a horror film, not a sci-fi film nowadays. Yep. Zoom in. Now, now there's some connections to that of the original TV show. Now, here's the thing about this: this particular film was this was the first live action thing that Star Trek has done since 1969. I say live action because it was an animated series released just prior to at least several years prior to this that lasted for a good couple years but got canceled. It was made by the same people who made the Super Friends TV show. Yep. Oh, and this series is not worthy for a few different things. One, it brought back some characters from the original show. Two, it actually did not feature a checkoff on the show. I heard because of budget reasons I couldn't have him on the show, but he did write one episode, the worst episode of the entire series. Yeah, he actually wrote the like the episode is going to be the worst one. And let's see what else. Oh yeah, the thing with Shatner was with doing this period time between the original series and this film. The only one he did, he did B movies. One of them happened to be a really awful film called Devil's Reign. I have sat that film. Man, this film was bizarre. The whole thing was about promoting Satanism. 
That's the whole point of this particular bizarre film. And it's disgusting to watch. Especially since well, there was one scene involving a goat's head. No, it does not involve sacrificing a goat. It's basically a goat's head used as a freaking TV. Yeah, it's one of the most bizarre films I have ever seen. Do you have favorite? Just, if you want to, I only watched because Shatner was in it. It's the only reason why I watched it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this film is not, now, as for most picture, okay, the film is not worthy for two reasons. One, it's terror pacing, and two, the awful costumes they had to wear during this particular film. The suits, those of you curious about the suits, uh, the, the outfit, the uniforms they wear in this particular film, this is the only live action appearance you see of these things. The only time these suits have ever appeared is in the cover of novels. I'm not kidding. Yes, there's some Star Trek novels with them wearing these awful uniforms. And from what I've heard, these things were itchy. And the only person who actually liked wearing these uniforms is George the K. And this is a guy who actually came out in the last several years saying he actually really didn't like... He basically had a big grudge against Shatner. Yeah. And this is, this is of course, after he was he out himself as gay. Yeah, he out himself as gay back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. This film is also... Not worthy for a few other things. One, the last time Christine Chapel was ever seen on screen. Christine Chapel doesn't know who this character is. She was the head nurse on the Enterprise, the original Enterprise in the show, and she was portrayed by the wife of Gene Rottenberry. Yes, the same woman who also will portray on Next Generation, one of the most somewhat annoying but memorable characters of the entire show, Loxana Troy, the mother of Deanna Troy. A woman who was annoying and who basically wanted to sleep with card frequently the whole show. Yeah. And she eventually, if you see this woman, like, what way she looks. I mean, this is a woman who looks like she's probably in her 40s, and yet she had her child. Yeah, she had two kids. One, of course, had to be seven. Now, of course, she's a freaking grandmother. Yeah. Thanks, of course, for daughter getting married to William Riker in, in the 10th, in which I'll get to that film in the near future. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the story for this film was adapted from an episode... Uh, from what I've heard, a show called Star Trek Phase 2. If you see concepts for the show, the ships look so bizarre. Yeah, the way the Enterprise is going to be redesigned is like a small circle, a little like, stick, and it is weird. And apparently it's going to be like a, like, they use a story from the show. Apparently, the story for the film was actually taken from the pilot of the show. And two of the characters appearing in this film are from that pilot. And who these characters okay now there are two members of the cast who actually are only in this film and don't appear after this one of course is William Decker those of you who don't know who this character is of course you may know his character on seventh heaven yes an actor by the name of Stephen Collins this is by far his only appearance in Star Trek films and this thing Decker why does that sound so familiar yes it has been confirmed in Star Trek novels and I think even Paramount has confirmed this that this guy is the side of the character Matthew Decker from the awesome episode, The Doomsday Machine. Yes, by far one of the best episodes of season three. Yeah, one of my personal favorites as well. It's exciting, gripping, and a good bottle show. Yeah, and of course, his father was appeared by an actor who would, 20 years later, appear on one of the best, one of the best um, dramas on television on CBS, Murder Show, as a, as, as a recurring character. Basically, a town doctor. Yep. We also have Ileana. Yeah, I should point out, though, she is bald. Yep, bald. Yeah, the actor who portrayed Matt Decker is a guy named William Wyndham. Mm -hmm. I don't think this guy's still alive. Mm, no, he actually passed away just roughly six years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he this guy was on Murder Shira. If you see this guy, if you any of you ever watched the the Aus now I should point out though, Murder Shira is a it, despite the fact it's a crime drama, but it's a very good crime drama, and it's Angela Lansbury basically being the star of the entire matter of fact, she's the only character who appears in the entire show. Which is quite odd for a show that has a bunch of recurring characters and only one regular. Yeah, it's particularly very weird. Though she's a murder writer, she's a a, a, a murder a, let's say a mystery writer who gets involved in mur mysteries, kind of similar with Castle. Though in the case of Castle, he becomes a consultant to the police in one city, not traveling the country or a freaking planet. Mm -hmm. Yep. And as for Ileana herself, this is by far the only one I've seen this actress in. 
Paris uh, Colum, do you think I can't say pronounce her name? Yeah. Aside from hearing it, of course, she's passed away. She passed away back in 1998. She's actress is Indian. Yes, she's Indian. Aside from this film, she didn't appear in that many of my films. Like, I'm looking at her biography right now. Like, I have never seen any of her films aside from this one. Mm -hmm. In the case of, well, the actress, well, Decker, I've seen like one episode of Seventh Heaven. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's see what else. Um, now, as for the whole thing of the refit, basically the interior got refitted because if you saw the interior of the Enterprise, now this is what the Enterprise looks like in pretty much the original films. Yeah, the original Enterprise A, which I should point out though, exterior-wise never changed at all from the moment it showed up back in the pilot episode, The Cage, up until its last physical appearance, no, with Enterprise A at that point, and now it's the country. Pretty much look exactly the same. The only thing that did change about was the interior. Yeah, the interior looks a lot different in this film. Even engineering looks completely different. Yeah, engineering, like, wow. If you watch that look on the show itself, and this film, it's drastically different. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I should point out that this is the only film that you see the actor who plays Montgomery Scott. What's his name? His name is uh, the late James Newhan. Yeah, this is by from the only film you see him in where actually his hair is not white. Yes, because from the second movie forward, his hair changes color, but he still has that mustache. If you watch the original show, he is clean shaven. Yeah, he is clean shaven the entire show. And so with this film, he is got a mustache. In the case of Doohan himself, I've never seen anything outside of Star Trek. Well, actually, no, I did see him in the simulator for the at the Empire State Building observation, like the, the simulator ride that takes you around New York. What guy himself appears in that thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this basically also has DeForest Kelly reprising his role as Dr. McCoy. Basically, uh, the joke was he looked like the Unabomber. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And let's see what else. Nimoy himself basically... I had heard something that after this film, he basically was a contract that's with Paramount. So, Tekken basically had sort of kill him off anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the way he shows up in the film is kind of interesting. He's on Vulcan. This is Spock. And he's basically going through this special ritual. It gives him like a special medal. And apparently he's taking the, the, the strange entity that pops in the film called V'ger. Now, as now you mentioned the film that Vij went to this place involving machines. It's it's implied in the novels that this encountered the Borg. I'm not kidding. If you read the Star Trek novels, it is very heavily implied this thing, this this satellite. Yeah, they feel it's an actual satellite. It's a Voyager six satellite. They feel it's toward the end of the film, and they basically reveal that it's implied. They say a world of machines. And it was very vague, and the film never explained what the heck this was at all. And as far as I could tell, Viju was never seen again. I mean, it only had one mention in the entire novels. That wasn't a Shat that wasn't a Shatner novel called the Return, which had basic had Willie really had Kirk brought back as a freaking Borg. Yeah, this is of course after the events of Star Trek Generations. Yeah, it's one of the most bizarre Star Trek novels I've ever read, and involves somehow of that. Being contact with Vager, it means from means McCoy, not McCoy, Spock returned to a freaking Borg. Yeah. Those of you curious about the actual real life Voyager satellites, there were only two ever made as far as I've heard. Yeah, they've both been since been lost. And this one was rumored to be lost in a freaking black hole of all things. Yes, that's what really explained in the film. They don't show what this thing looks like until much later in the film. Yeah, how they explain... Now, this film is also noteworthy for the first film appearance of the Klingons. And this is also the first appearance uh, in live action of their bumpy foreheads. Yeah, it's... The way they look in this film is not very good. They look a lot better in Search for Spock. They, yeah, they get a much better makeover in that film. Yeah, and of course you see three D7 cruisers get destroyed by this strange cloud. No, you're probably thinking, wait... A cloud that attacks her. Oh no, is it freaking Galactus? No, no, this is years before that awful looking Galactus. That thing that claimed to be Galactus in Fantastic Four rises over a surfer. 
Yeah. And of course, the story that, of course, the whole thing with Kirk is he gets back to the Enterprise to being on Earth for two years. Though in the book, that actually is not true. He did went to another planet. He went to, he went to, he actually left Earth during that period of time once to follow up an episode from, from a private little war. Yeah, the episode went to an alien planet where all the people look like humans because, well, 60s are cheap. Yeah. I don't think about the arms race and the victor, that's what the guys call themselves. Yeah, if you read that novel, it basically contradicts basically the narrative of Moach Picture that, that Kirk never left Earth throughout the two years he was basically the two years he was stationed on Earth. My guess is the reason why it's never talked about in the film, because it was unofficial. Yeah. It was unofficial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they bring in, like, a Vulcan to be a science officer, because, well, Vulcans are a science officer, okay. And so Kirk gets on board, gets the Enterprise back somehow in a, in a conversation. According to him, it's been maybe about five minutes. Yeah, somehow this is, this particular thing gets him back to the Enterprise. Somehow. Though that doesn't explain what happens to Enterprise in the next film. Yeah. And you see the bridge for the first time in the ship. It looks, it's a damn good looking bridge. I mean, I like it. It's a really cool looking. The only thing I don't like about it is the captain's chair. It looks awful. I mean, the armrest just basically covers his legs. I mean, seriously. It's like they basically just didn't care about the captain's chair. Now, on the show, it's this big square-like chair that's sort of elevate. I like the, I like the original Enterprise bridge. From the show, the bridge in this film, it looks really good. It's basically well made. It looks like that, with the exception of the captain's chair, it looks like they took their time with this thing and basically made a fantastic looking bridge. The captain's chair looks awful. Yeah, they made this ugly brownish color. Oh, in the later films, they made it pink for like no reason at all. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody's like so excited to be back out in ship. Yeah, and let's see what else. Mm, yeah, it was like go out, and of course Decker, who was capped at that point, he gets more of the commander, but he stays on because he knows about the ship, and not a bad idea for someone who's basically been taking the ship for two years. Why not have him as acting for his officer? Okay. And then of course they make it the Vulcan, and apparently there's something wrong with the transporter in the in. I've never heard exactly exactly explanation of why this particular Vulcan character had to be killed off in the film. Yeah, I don't know the reason why. And they kill off this random human woman via the transport. Apparently, it's a problem with the transporter. Almost everything else in the ship looks working perfectly fine. Well, they kept the transport and the freaking warp drive. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. And, like, they get out of the ship. Now, I should point out, though, they spend... Way too much time with the glory shot of the Enterprise. I mean, my gosh. Like, oh my... Yeah, this is something, though. When they first show up the Enterprise in this film... Okay. The sequence takes up ten minutes of screen time. Like, you show up the wonderful sight. You think, oh yeah, I think that's done. Nope. They have to show up the freaking front. I mean, my gosh, they spend way too much time on the glory shot in this film. It's one of the things about this film that gets heavily criticized. One of the pacing problems. Yeah, so much of the ship. Get on board. I mean, a side fan engineering looks different. I mean, the quarters look a li look actually look actually they do they do look different. I do praise them for that. And I mean, I mean they show the observation lines later. Okay, they show like very similar ship enterprise. They show the shuttle crap, the the space shuttle, which actually does exist in real life. I have seen, I've been on a space shuttle, well, not physically anyways, it was basically a model K space shuttle. They show the aircraft carrier, the ship, basically a similar thing they show on the Enterprise TV show, except they, they don't have Enterprise here. Of course, the joke was, the film was that we don't mention Archer. <laughs> Though this, is, this, this movie was made like roughly like 20 two years before the start of Enterprise. Because Enterprise started back in 2001. This song came out in 79. Yep. And they bring up the character Leah, who apparently is an old girlfriend of Will Decker's. Yeah, it was from a planet 
where they had like saying like, oh, we had the vow of celibacy on board uh, on record. Yeah, I agree with the criticism of that line. It's like, really? Was that really necessary to put in the film? Okay. And they can contact a V'ger, and she, of course, is apparently killed. They don't officially confirm it. She just gets, she just sort of gets vaporized, and then brought back as a freaking robot with basically her skin. <laughs> it is bizarre. And apparently she's developed like this robot version of Aaliyah is of attraction to, well, Decker. It's never developed with the whole film. Oh yeah, when Spock shows up in the film, it is right after they do the the first thing they use the warp drive, and it's like going through a wormhole, and it's a very bizarre looking sequence. Like my gosh, it is so bizarre. It's like, like here's basically how they did the lines. Like, check off, ready the phasers. And then Decker's like, no, belay that phaser order. And they tell, he basically runs out check and goes, fire torpedoes. Torpedoes armed. Torpedoes firing. And then they destroy this asteroid that popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is quite bizarre. And that is when basically Spock shows up in the film again. And he comes in this film in this very odd-looking shuttlecraft, or apparently detached from this warp drive thing. Oh, and by the way, this thing is never seen again in the film. They don't explain what happened to it. It just like, okay, it detaches from the warp. This basically it detaches from his warp cells. It goes on the Enterprise. He he basically just shows up. Apparently, gets like a sort of a like reads over thing. Like, okay, I resume my post. At, I press to resume my post as science officer. And Kirk's like, sure, go ahead. And Decker has no problem with it either, because, well, even though he was technically made acting science officer due to the fact that, well, the person he wanted to be science officer because Spock wasn't available, died, and why the heck not? It's not a bad idea. Oh, and Ileana? What was her, basically, role? She was the ship's helmsman. Yeah. I should point out, though, on the show, Chekhov was the helmsman in the film. He's the weapons officer. Yeah, they kind of switch on roles a bit, where... I think Chekhov was like kind of like the 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 navigator, and the weapons officer was actually, believe it or not, Sulu. Yeah, Sulu was in charge of the weapons on the show. They kind of gave him the job of basically being being the helmsman in this film, and she's like the navigator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of like their budding romance between her and Deck before the, she gets basically vaporized, and then they go and they then after they do the whole. The, I should point out the glory shots are the only time in the, in the movie they have pointless padding in this film just to drag out the runtime. The other time when they go inside V'ger, it's like, look at stuff, look at stuff. It's like pointless reactions. And this actually goes on shorter than the glory sh than the massive 10 minute glory shot of the Enterprise. They get inside, they counter, well, the probe, anyways, and, they, and, it, and then they have. Basically, just Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, which complete obviously these three always going away mission. Anyways, they bring along Decker. Not a bad idea. My guess is they probably want to give him something to do because he's a new character. So they have him get contact with. They could close the V'ger and website Ash. They, they call him V'ger because basically part of the name is basically covered up. And it's, of course, this would be Voyager Six. And it's like okay, green key in the sequence and and of course Decker volunteers to do it, even though Kirk wanted to do it himself. And he says, you want an Enterprise? I want this. And he becomes like a god, merged with Aaliyah, basically a massive sort of like explosion. They get out of there really quickly. And of course, Vedra explodes, and it's never up in the films ever again. And yeah, it's one of the most bizarre films of the entire series. Now, whenever I, ten whenever I usually watch this film, I usually fall asleep because of how boring this film is. I mean, there's some interesting sets. Uh, another interesting set is they show Kirk's quarters. Yeah, a lot of the time whenever Kirk has... Officer meetings, like, basically with, like, officers. There's no ready room for him for some reason. It's basically a freaking quiz freaking quarters. Well, at least this other room, which they don't show again in the film. And you have Spock sitting out in this square stool. And it is quite awkward. I do like this scene when they, um, when they go to Kirk's quarters. And it's like, yeah, Kirk asks Tekka, like, why'd you... And, of course, 
McCoy, because of course, in this show, he loves coming on board the bridge. That was a frequent thing. If you watch the show, McCoy would obviously show up on the bridge in like almost every episode he popped up in, with the exception of the two pilots. Yeah, that's basically a standard for the show. In the show itself, they usually use he's the other for just playing some medical reason. Here in the films, half the time in the films, they don't really explain it, like, oh, he just rambling on the bridge for some reason. Not even Dr. Crusher did that a lot in the next generation, or even any of the doctors. I mean, Bashir will show up occasionally, will show up regularly on the on the on the ops because, well, he has to be there, obviously. But a lot of the time, McCoy would show up frequently. Mm-hmm. And of course, he asked, like, why was my order counted? Because, well, the phases were turned off the engines, and of course, engines basically causing that whole warp thing. Okay. And Kirk basically accepts basically the explanation for why his phase war was belayed. Yeah. But despite Kirk's ego, I mean, everybody pretty much does a pretty good job in this whole film. It's basically a well written film. That's what, And the acting is fantastic, and the sets look really good. And the story is kind of weak, but I would say. Like, aside from the acting and the writing, the sets are fantastic. The special effects are really good. It's just that the pacing is the problem. And, of course, after this film, Gene Robert was kicked upstairs. Well, for a bit, then he got Next Generation for a couple years. And then he was kicked off that show, too. Mm-hmm. Though he did sort of have a role in the show at first, but not really a big one. He really got greatly reduced by the time the season three rolled around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's it for this particular view. My next movie review will be on Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The film that pretty much got the series back on track. Okay? But see you soon in the next review. Bye.